morning. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, part of the reason I'm here also is because I'm a friend of the Matthias family. Um, so my housemate is, let me work this out, Dave's brother's sister-in-law, something like that. <laughs> I'll draw you a chart later. Anyway... It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you. As Dave says, I work for an organisation called Living Out, uh, which is all about helping um, the church and individuals and society to engage with faith and sexuality. Uh, big issues, particularly at the moment in lots of different denominations um, and in the secular world. So we're trying to help people navigate those conversations about sexuality uh, with clarity and with kindness, as Dave has said. A uh, little bit about me, I live in Newcastle, um, the, the one near Scotland. <laughs> um, I'm single, I don't have kids, but I do have a lovely housemate, Abby, um, who's here today. And I have a lovely cat, Jonesy, who is not here today. <laughs> but that's, that's what he looks like. Um, we all love stories, don't we? Um, so there are some stories that I want to tell this morning um, as we look at how the Bible's teaching on sexuality is good news for everybody. So I'm going to start with a little bit of my story um, so that you know why I'm standing here talking to you about this. Then I want to dive into the Bible story on sexuality. Then we'll look briefly at the cultural story and the church's story and end with the Jesus story. I'm just saying the word story a lot because I'm thinking that might make you listen. There we go. So my story. I've been aware of attractions to women for as long as I can remember. I've never been a particularly girly girl. Uh, this is a picture of me at my fourth birthday party. Um, I'm the one in the tracksuit and the motorbike helmet. <laughs> Apparently, I only lifted the visor to eat my cake and it went straight back down again. I was obsessed with Jodie Foster and Martina Navratilova. I had no idea that they were gay icons. Um, being gay felt normal for me, um, and it was difficult in the, in the culture in the 1980s and 90s uh, when I was growing up. I was brought up with a nominal church-going background, um, so I knew lots of facts about God, um, but I didn't know God personally, and I thought that being a Christian was just about trying to be good, and if you were good enough, you might get into heaven. I thought I'd be rejected by God and by other Christians if I was open about being gay. I was attracted to a girl at my secondary school, um, and for lots of years I really struggled with my feelings, and I didn't have anyone to talk to about it. Um, I didn't know anyone else who was gay, so that shows how old I am, because I think it's quite different now, isn't it? I saw university as a chance to make a new life for myself, so I didn't intend to go to church anymore, um, and I actually studied philosophy because I wanted to know the meaning of life. So my, my two aims were find out the meaning of life, get a girlfriend. Those were my, uh, <laughs> my reasons for going to university. I used my newfound freedom to act just how I wanted, which involved a lot of drinking. Um, I joined the LGB society, didn't even have a T in those days. Um, and it was comforting to be in a group of people who knew what it felt like to grow up as, as an outsider um, and who loved and accepted me as I was. Meanwhile, there was this girl in my halls of residence. Um, she was a Christian, and I was a bit attracted to her, so I thought I'd go along to church with her. It's really not a, uh, not a pure motivation for going to church, but, you know, God uses all sorts, doesn't he? It was really different to my church at home, and I remember being struck by these people that it, it sounded as though they meant what they said, that their faith um, made a difference to the way that they lived their life. And I kind of realized that you probably had to make a choice to follow Jesus. A few weeks later, there was a talk in the student's slot by a man who shared his story of being a Christian who experienced same-sex attraction, um, but he'd chosen to be celibate in obedience to Jesus. And I'd never heard anybody talk like this before. Um, it made me realize that God loves gay people um, and that we can be included in his family. So I was still going along to the LGB group, but I was also going along to the Christian Union. I think I was the only person who was in both. Um, and I was increasingly thinking about what I'd been learning about Jesus. I asked a friend what the Bible says about homosexuality, and he'd pointed me to some passages uh, to look up. And I did lots of my own studying um, and became convinced, really, that God didn't want me to have a gay sexual relationship. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. 
I was still doing things deep down that I knew I shouldn't be. Um, but one day, I was walking back from an LGB night out in Soho, and I was just praying, <laughs> like you do when you've been <laughs> two o'clock in the morning, staggering home. I was just praying that God would help me to know what to do about some of the stuff I'd been learning. So before I went to sleep, I opened my Bible, Romans 8, um, and I just started reading Romans 8, 1 to 4. It'll come up, there we go. It was then that the truth of the gospel came into focus. It talked about there being no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I realized that I was condemned without Christ because I'd lived in rebellion to God, like everybody's lived in rebellion to God. But I could have a new life of forgiveness and freedom because of what Jesus did on the cross. So I called out to God saying that I wanted to follow him. I don't remember what exactly I said, but that's when I gave my life to Christ. Uh, which was the 10th of January, 1996, for people who like significant dates. I got increasingly involved in the Christian Union, um, but I have to say, at first, I hated it. Um, they sang lots of modern songs. <laughs> it's all right, I'm fine with them now. So <laughs> um, <laughs> They prayed freely out loud, all this stuff I wasn't used to. Um, my friend and I signed up to go on the house party, and I have to say, house party meant something slightly different to me. Um, so I got on the bus, um, I, was, I was smoking a cigarette, I had a bag full of alcohol. Um, <laughs> they were really lovely, um, just a little bit kind of, yeah, it's not that sort of house party. Um, it was quite a culture shock for me, but the people were absolutely lovely and just really keen to introduce me to Jesus. That's 27 years ago, and I've been working through issues of sexuality um, a lot through over the, over the years I've been a Christian. Um, I've made lots of progress, and I've made mistakes as well. I've sometimes doubted the goodness of God's word, and I've had a number of sexual relationships with women in my early Christian life. I felt the heartache of ending those relationships, and there have been times where I've really struggled to go on as a Christian, if I'm honest. But God is gracious and he's kind and he's compassionate and he's never abandoned me. He's won my heart with his love and I know that my identity is a precious daughter of my heavenly father. I'm loved and accepted and forgiven and free to live life in all its fullness. So that's what I want to talk a little bit about now. How do we, um, whatever our sexualities, whatever our backgrounds, how do we live life in all its fullness? Let's have a look at the Bible story on sexuality. What does holy biblical sexuality look like? We haven't got an awful lot of time this morning. Uh, we're going to talk a bit more this, this evening. But I want to do a whistle-stop tour of what biblical sexuality looks like and why it's good for all of us. Lots of the debate around homosexuality f focuses on the five clobber passages uh, that specifically mention and condemn homosexual sex. Uh, so there's Genesis, Genesis 19, Leviticus 18 and 20, Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, and 1 Timothy 1. I'm actually not going to major on any of these, partly because there isn't time, and partly, I think, because if you're determined, you can find a scholar who will agree with uh, what you want to hear. I've looked into the best affirming arguments, uh, but I do think they all fall short of the mark. There are some really good resources if you do want to explore these passages in particular. Um, I would particularly recommend Preston Sprinkle. I <laughs> I've, I've said his name so many times, it's just brilliant, isn't it? Preston Sprinkle. He's, uh, he's American, it won't surprise you at all. Um, he's written a thing called 15 Affirming Arguments and 15 Responses, uh, which you can get free from the Centre for Faith.com. They're really good. And there are some articles on our Living Out site. But what I will say is that all these passages um, condemn gay sex. Even if we could explain them all away, we're still a long way short from being able to make a biblical case uh, that gay sex is something that God blesses and that glorifies him. The main point, though, is that I think focusing on just these passages is a misstep which has caused a lot of confusion and missed the big picture. These passages need to be seen in the context of the overall scriptural pattern for sexuality and for human flourishing. Over the last 15 years or so, I've become increasingly convinced that God's blueprint for sexuality is wonderful and life-giving for LGBT people like me. 
I was quite a romantic, idealistic teenager. Um, I used to really enjoy writing poetry and songs, um, sort of dreaming of the perfect uh, relationship. I read the, the lesbian classic, The Well of Loneliness. I always wanted to be part of a love story. And I think that's the case for many of us, isn't it? I wanted to be part of a love story, and I found myself caught up in a cosmic love story that will last for eternity. I haven't had to neuter my sexuality, but I can use it to adore my saviour. So let's see how that works. First of all, our sexuality is God-given. We're all unique, aren't we? 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that we're all different parts of one body. I love spotting ladybirds, um, pun very much intended there. Um, these ladybirds are all one species called the harlequin, and yet look how different they are. Um, no two ladybirds are the same. And on top of that, there are about 5,000 species of ladybirds globally. It's like the ladybirds, each one of us is uniquely different and intimately known by God. We're embodied people, and to state the obvious, women are different from men. Our bodies have different roles to play. We have different anatomies, both male and female, and we image God together. So we each have a unique personality, and along with that, a unique sexuality. But secondly, we're all imperfect, aren't we? All of us are living with the legacy of the fall, humankind's rebellion against God. Nobody is looking at this from a neutral position of a perfect sexuality. Whether we're same-sex attracted or opposite-sex attracted, whether we're married or single, our sexual desires are corrupted. But the second point I want to make is that our sexuality has a purpose. Firstly, marriage. It's a theme which runs right from the start of the Bible, from the garden in Eden, in Genesis, to the city in Revelation. There's lots of debate in our culture and to some extent in our church about how we define marriage, isn't there? I prefer to go to the words of Jesus to find the definition. In Matthew 19, 5, Jesus defines marriage by quoting Genesis 2, 24, which says, A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. There we have the Bible's definition of marriage. It's unity in difference. It's male and female becoming one. This one flesh, unity, is a God-designed context for sexual expression. Sexual dis difference isn't a, isn't a sort of negotiable part of that. Sexual difference is the way that humanity mirrors the triune God. If you look at Genesis 1, 26 to 27, you can see that clearly. Christian marriage also puts the gospel on display. It points to the relationship between God and his people. So it's much bigger than just two people who fancy each other deciding to, you know, club together for tax benefits. It mirrors the relationship between God and his people, who are different to each other, yet united to one another. Marriage mirrors the good news that humans can be united to Christ. Have a look at Ephesians 5, verses 31 to 32. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Obviously, within marriage, sex is an amazingly positive thing. It's pleasurable. Song of Songs kind of alludes to that. It can bring the blessing of children, but it's also a gift rather than a right. And if we don't get married or we don't get to have a sexual relationship, we're not missing out. I'll talk more about that later. Secondly, our sexuality has the purpose of appreciating God. It helps us appreciate God's passionate love for his people. In the Old Testament, God is often pictured as a faithful husband who loves unfaithful Israel. I'm reading through the, uh, the Bible in a year, and I'm kind of in the bit where <laughs> uh, Israel just cannot be faithful for, you know, a week. They're just off, off and all over the place, rebellious, rebellious. And what is absolutely striking is God's steadfast love for them as a husband to a wayward bride. The imagery of adultery, though, it illuminates the seriousness of sin and rebellion against God. It's like ripping a marriage apart, isn't it? When God's people go their own way rather than God's, it's like having an affair. That's how serious rebellion against God is. 
says in Isaiah, for your maker is your husband, the Lord Almighty is his name, the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer, he is called the God of all the earth. In Jeremiah, but like a woman unfaithful to her husband, so you, Israel, have been unfaithful to me, declares the Lord. And Hosea's marriage to adulterous Gomer was a lived out picture of God's faithfulness to his people and passionate love for them in spite of their unfaithfulness. My sexuality helps me appreciate how deeply and passionately and faithfully and jealously God loves me, more than I've ever loved anyone in my life and more than anyone will ever love me. And the third purpose of sexuality is that it points us forward to the new creation. Our sexuality helps us to understand what we're looking forward to in the new creation. The theme of God as the faithful husband is continued in the New Testament, isn't it? When Jesus is questioned about fasting, he explains that his disciples don't fast because he's still with them. He refers to himself as the bridegroom when he says, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he's with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, then they will fast. So the church is the bride and will one day be caught up in the perfect wedding day. So that's weird, I'm going to get married. I never thought that was going to happen. (laughs) The whole of history is heading towards the new creation and the ultimate wedding. Look at what God says about our future in Revelation 19, 6-7. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. That's us. The church is the bride, Christ is the bridegroom. All imperfect earthly marriages are pointing towards this. Earthly marriages are like the trailer at the cinema for the film of the new creation. No one who gets to see the film goes, oh, if only I'd seen the trailer. In the new creation, none of us are going to regret not being married or not having sex in this life. None of us are going to miss out on the deep community of God's people enjoying God forever. That's why it's so crucial to keep eternal perspective when we're thinking about sexuality and marriage and singleness. I'm going to show you a really short video that basically summarises what I've been saying, but in a lot less time. (laughs) A trailer at the cinema has been designed to make you want to enjoy the film it advertises. It gives you a foretaste of a future reality that could be yours if you watch the film. Sex and marriage have been designed to make you want to enjoy the future they advertise. They give you a foretaste of a future reality that could be yours if you follow Jesus. Any joy in sex and marriage now is just a trailer for the future joy all Christians will experience united, married to God's son Jesus forever. So, if you get to enjoy sex and marriage now, you're just enjoying the trailer. If you don't enjoy sex and marriage now, You're just missing the trailer. All who follow Jesus will get to enjoy the real thing. Great. So the Bible has good news for us when it comes to sexuality. But how do we communicate its goodness in a culture that has such a different perspective? I want to just look at the cultural story for a few moments and then see how we can respond. You may have noticed that the biblical story is just a little bit different from the story in our culture. Our culture is one that conflates sex and intimacy, and it makes romantic relationships the ultimate good. Whether we like it or not, uh, we're surrounded by it, and it feeds into our own thoughts and desires as well, doesn't it? Sex is seen as a primary goal in life in our culture. There's a strong message that you're not fulfilled if you're not having sex, and that there might even be something wrong with you. Society is is quite set up for couples, isn't it? In restaurants and holidays and things. Um, I always uh, get a bit annoyed at having to pay the single room supplement when I go away. Aspirational family setups have always been used in adverts as ways of selling things. Look at this 7-Up advert, uh, I think it's from the 50s. 
Brands are adapting, sometimes controversially, and portraying different types of family setup and role models. Um, but it's all focused around sex and romance and finding that special person. So here's River Island redefining family for us. You hardly ever see happy single people, especially happy older single people, being used to sell things. No wonder many people experience a chronic fear of missing out and make it their ultimate goal to have a romantic sexual relationship. There's an assumption that every, everyone is either having sex or wanting to have sex. In fact, I, uh, I take some medication and it's actually um, important for me not to get pregnant while I'm taking this medication. And I went to the pharmacist to pick it up and uh, he started sort of going on and on about how dangerous it would be for me to get pregnant and he was talking about, you know, what contraception you're using. And I did try to explain <laughs> to him that I did, that wasn't really an issue. <laughs> And in the end, he just wasn't getting the message. So in the end, I just had to say to him, I'm not having sex. <laughs> and he got really embarrassed and ran off into a store cupboard. And, uh, but it's unusual, isn't it? You know, he was making all these assumptions about me when in actual fact, uh, I wasn't pursuing a sexual relationship. Films and literature and music and Disney and royal weddings, they all tell this fairy tale story of romantic bliss. Lots of Downton plot lines re revolve around rom romance and marriage. The implication is that unless you're having sex, you're condemned to a life of isolation and loneliness. I had a trawl around the web looking for stuff on virginity. I have a weird job. <laughs> <laughs> and it's almost universally ridiculed. Um, so here's a BBC article about the sadness of living without sex. Here's a Guardian advice column that says, I'm 34 and still a virgin. What's wrong with me? There are cases of people um, choosing celibacy, but it's often for a short period or because of bad experiences with sex. This author remains anonymous, and uh, his reason for choosing celibacy was because he had a degenerative brain condition. I'm interested by their choice of image to illustrate this story. I think <laughs> the fact that there aren't any contemporary images of celibacy is quite revealing, isn't it? Culturally, sex is a big deal and there's a huge pressure to not miss out. What about the church's story? Have we been any more helpful? Let me just say, I love the church. <laughs> and indeed, we're all part of the church, aren't we? But we need to acknowledge that sometimes the church has just offered a Christianized version of the secular story. We saw earlier that losing virginity is often seen as a rite of passage into adulthood. Um, it's often seen that there's something wrong with you if, you if you're still a virgin when you're older. In much of church culture, that can just be replaced with marriage. There's a very real danger that we idolize marriage and elevate it above singleness. We've got into a mess over gay marriage a little bit because we've bought into the cultural narrative that you're unfulfilled without sex. So we feel like denying anybody the opportunity to have sex is somehow unfair or harmful. We're still making sex an ultimate thing. We're making it an idol. We need to acknowledge where we've gone wrong when it comes to singleness in the church. So here are some of the damaging narratives that you may be familiar with. True Love Waits, uh, the True Love Waits movement, um, lots of good things about that, you know, encouraging young people not to have sex uh, before they're married. The problem is that it treats singleness as a holding pattern for when the real life of nuclear family starts. The purpose of being pure and not having sex before you're married is that when you get married, you'll have great sex. It assumes that people will get married, um, and it equates love with sex. Uh, this one talks about a season of singleness, like it's a bit of time out from real life. You know, singleness is okay for a season, you know, uh, but it's not, it's not the real deal. The next one says, uh, it, again, it, it, it gives that sense that if you do singleness well, you'll have a great marriage. And my favourite one, uh, long-term singleness. Notice how the colours have changed here. It's gone black, really depressed-looking woman. <laughs> And the language is all about how do you cope? How do you cope with long-term singleness? Not thrive or flourish or bless others, but cope. Single people are, are often seen as a problem rather than a gift to the church, aren't they? We often say that marriage and singleness are both gifts because we are aware that that's biblical. And I really love it when I hear that articulated in church. But often we don't act like they're both good gifts, do we? 
the cliche that singleness is the gift that no one wants. Uh, actually, this is the gift that no one wants. It was given to... <laughs> It was given to my housemate, and we're kind of working it, trying to work out what it is. It's basically like a sort of ceramic money box cat handbag. <laughs> Who doesn't want one of those? <laughs> Weirdly enough, there's a factory somewhere making them. <laughs> anyway, we often treat singleness like the cat handbag, like the gift that no one wants. So how can we tell a better story, the Jesus story? The world around us is filled with the narrative that sex is about pleasure, that we need it in order to flourish, that our sexuality defines our identity, and that if we're missing out on sex, we're missing out on intimacy. And often the church echoes that a little bit by subtly implying that marriage and family are better than singleness. If we believe those things, then no wonder the Christian sexual ethic sounds outdated and even harmful. But I firmly believe that what God says about sex isn't arbitrary. He doesn't lay down rules to make our lives miserable. If I trust that God is my good heavenly father, then I know that the boundaries that he puts in place for sexual expression are for my good and that they're life-giving for me as a same-sex attracted person as well as for everybody else. It's not some cruel test that I have to grudgingly bear before I finally limp into heaven, having missed out on what everyone else gets to enjoy. So could it be that the biblical sexual ethic that's often criticized for being outdated and even harmful is actually the answer to the loneliness and the pain and the broken relationships all around us? Could it be that it's not about what I can't do, but about enjoying the very best relationships possible with God and with each other? What if biblical sexuality is better than the alternative? What if it's the way that human beings are meant to flourish? Let me make a few points. First of all, is that our identity is God-given, and we touched on this earlier. The world around us says that sex defines our identity. But the truth is that God made us who we are. We don't have to guess. That's massively liberating. We're all made in the image of God. We're his creatures, so living out that identity is the route to having the best possible life. We're precious in God's sight, regardless of whether we're having sex or whether we're in a romantic human relationship. We can all experience the intimacy that we're created for and crave. So how do we live out that identity? Well, being a disciple is about following somebody. And who do we follow? It's not a trick question, it's Jesus. Jesus is the suffering saviour. What does he ask of people when he calls us to follow him? Well, he says, take up your cross, lose your life to gain it. If we want people to take our message about Jesus seriously, we need to live a life of integrity and follow him wholeheartedly with everything we have, including our sexualities. And the weird upside-downness of Jesus' kingdom means that when we lay down our lives for Jesus and give up everything to follow him, we gain a life that is far better than anything we would have chosen for ourselves. We also get to experience freedom from the need for sex. As Christians, we can enjoy um, liberty from the cultural idolatry of sex, freedom from seeing sex as a right, um, which often in the secular world brings us into conflict with other people's rights to consent, and we've seen some awful disastrous things happening. We have the freedom from, f from feeling unloved or unlovable if we're not having sex. Lots of people are chasing sex because they acknowledge a need inside themselves to be loved. But love and sex aren't the same thing, are they? So, so we certainly don't need to be having sex, but we all need intimacy. It's a legitimate hunger inbuilt in all of us. We just need to satisfy it in the right place. So it's a bit like hunger, isn't it? Uh, we all have a legitimate need for food. You can't live on a diet of junk food. Believe me, I have tried. <laughs> I lived by myself for a year opposite a Chinese takeaway, so um, <laughs> it wasn't the healthiest time of my life. We can't exist on a diet of junk food, but we can't eat nothing either because we starve. Often the church's answer has been, stop eating the junk food, stop having the bad relationships, but we haven't provided any alternatives. What we need is better food. 
And I'm going to be talking a lot more about that uh, this evening. How do we provide a church culture that helps people to thrive? One of the pervading myths of our culture with Christians and non-Christians is that celibacy is too difficult. I have said that at various points during my life, and I've had to fight to hand my sexual relationships over to Jesus. But celibacy isn't just possible. It's actually worth it. Sex is certainly one way of experiencing intimacy with another person, but it's not the only way. Little chance that I drew um, shows that, you know, sex within marriage, that is a way of experiencing intimacy, but there are so many other ways and so many other relationships where we can get that legitimate need met. Intimacy in the family of Christ. People in the world around us crave intimacy and they think that sex is the way to get it. But the good news is that regardless of our biological family, knowing Jesus brings us into a new family that means we have parents and children and siblings and aunties and the occasional like really awkward uncle. I think this is a brilliant thing that we can say to the world. You don't need to be having a sexual or romantic relationship to have value and meaning because the creator of the universe loves you intimately and wants you to know him, and he wants to draw you into the loving community of his people. In order for us to live fulfilled, sexually pure, godly lives, whether married or single, we need Christian community. We need the family of God. And this doesn't just help us walk the path of discipleship. It helps non-Christians to see the gospel in action. We'll talk a lot more about this later this evening. And finally, pleasures everlasting. Let's be honest, sex is pleasurable some of the time, although sometimes it isn't. Obviously, it can cause a lot of hurt and heartache. Christians aren't against pleasure or sex. In fact, we want the best pleasure possible. The traditional sexual ethic brings with it a huge amount of freedom to enjoy enjoy life as it's meant to be. Sex between two married people in a committed lifelong union points to the union that we can all enjoy with Christ. And for those of us who are single, our sexuality shows us the depth of God's desire for us. It reveals the sufficiency of his love and it draws us into intimacy with him. It's not just about the here and now. As Christians, we get to enjoy everlasting pleasures that far outweigh even the best experiences that we have now. When we see happy gay couples and we can't see what's wrong with them expressing their sexuality with each other, or we can't see what's wrong with casual hookups or having a succession of romantic partners, it's essential to see the bigger picture. They're missing out on the greatest intimacy with Jesus in the present and in the future. That's not something that I want for any of my friends. I want them to enjoy the true pleasure and freedom of being with Jesus forever. So what about your story? I recognize I've said a lot this morning. Um, Some of it may be new to you. You may already be a follower of Jesus, and you may not. You might be gay or straight, or maybe you're not sure. You're just wrestling through your sexuality. You might be married or single or in a complicated relationship. You might have messed up sexually and be wondering if there's hope for you. Well, let me encourage you and challenge you. I personally know the pain and the cost of giving my sexuality to Jesus in order to follow him wholeheartedly. It's often been heartbreakingly difficult. I've messed up in sexual relationships and I've found forgiveness in Jesus. I'm now free to live the life uh, that he calls me to in the joy of the gospel. I didn't choose my attractions. Um, I've never been attracted to men, and I probably never will be, but that's okay. I'm not living with shame or internalized homophobia. I found a deep peace about my sexuality in Jesus. I found freedom from the need to define myself by who I'm attracted to. My core identity is precious daughter of my heavenly father, and that's unshakable and everlasting. The Holy Spirit enables me to live my life surrendering everything, including my sexual desires, to Christ, knowing that what I gain is infinitely more than what I give up. And in terms of my sexuality, I don't have to stop loving women. In fact, I'm called to love women I don't even like. Um, 
I enjoy deeper and more satisfying intimacy with female friends than I did when I was in a sexual relationship. I'm less lonely uh, than lots of my friends who are in straight or gay marriages. God isn't calling me not to love women. He's calling me not to have romantic relationships or sexual relationships with them. But actually, loving my female friends deeply and well means pointing them to Jesus and not getting in the way of their relationship with God. Our culture, and sadly often the church, promotes the message that you need a sexual relationship or marriage to be truly fulfilled. But the good news is that for all of us, there is one who will love us unconditionally, always be faithful, always be there. And that can never be a human husband or wife. All of us, whether single or married, can experience the love that we crave in Jesus and in his family. We all want to be loved by someone who would lay down their life for us. There are lots of counterfeits trying to seduce us, but we can know the real thing. True love which brings enriching and meaningful life. This is one of my favorite things that Jesus said. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. If we follow the good shepherd rather than the thief, we can know the true love that we're all looking for. So how's your story going to go? Are you going to trust Jesus, the perfect lover, surrender your sexuality to him and experience life to the full? Just have a moment to think about that. Lord, thank you that you call us to have life to the full. Thank you that your word is such good news for all of us, wherever we're at, whatever we struggle with, wherever we've messed up. Lord, thank you that you love us enough to come and die for us, that we can have an eternal relationship with you um, that can never be taken away. Thank you that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And Lord, help each of us today to respond um, to that in the way that you know we need to. Help us to soak up your word. Help us to submit every area of our life to you, knowing that following you is the way for us to flourish. Because you created us, you know us, and you love us deeply. Amen.